people. And, uh, okay, let's start um, talking about the problem. So I'll begin. Just a second, I wanna put this here. You see that tower is not straight. It's not straight enough. It's a beautiful tower, but it's not straight. Is that true? But it's still a beautiful picture. Yeah. Okay, so um, here is a picture of a tower with a pump boom. And the pump boom is our control room, okay? It's a safe place that we can protect all of the electronic devices that we have and control and monitor the water quantity and the water quality, okay? So the pump room will be located at the main tower, um, usually a 10 meter tower, as you can see in the picture, or a seven meter tower. Um, so I can imagine that when I say pump room, everybody might have a different idea because you've seen so many different kinds of pump rooms. And I wanna just say that now um, the water engineering department in IA has um, designed a standard design for the pump room, okay? And from now on, we expect that the standard design um, will be implemented across all countries, okay? Um, we expect that the water engineers, our water engineers and all the engineers, if possible, to print out this design and have it with you in the field. And even more importantly, have, make sure that the contractors have it printed in their hands when they build the pump room, okay? Um, so this is a pump room section as shown in our design. It shows the order in which the accessories in the pump room are need to be installed. So this design I'm showing you is actually um, installed on, on two walls. So it, when you enter the pump room, the pipes will be on the right-hand side wall and the wall in front. And this dashed line, if you see my mouse, which you don't, I think, um, the dashed line in the middle is where uh, the, pipe, the pipe bends. And I'll show you it um, later on. So this is the water flowing from the borehole to the tank. So um, why do we need the pump room and all its accessories? Um, as I mentioned, we need the pump room for monitoring the water flow, the water quantity and the water quality. And uh, at times we'll need to commit maintenance of the borehole and the tank. So every accessory uh, in can you hear? Every accessory in the pump room is there for a reason. And I'll try to um, explain the reason and the logic behind um, every accessory. So um, why do we need the, the pump room and its all, all, its, all its accessories? I'll break it down. Um, I'll show you each, the logic of each accessory and its place. And I wanna um, emphasize again that from here going forward, this is the design that we wanna see in all pump rooms, okay? So as Sivan mentioned, and as I guess South Africa might know the best, we have many variations of the pump room. For one tower, multiple towers, one borehole, multiple boreholes, UPVC or galvanized steel, and uh, today I'm going over the basic and most popular kind of pump room and project, which is one tower with one borehole out of galvanized steel that the borehole is under the tower, okay? So like I said, there's different, different kinds of variations and designs, um, but you'll have all the variations in the manuals. And, the, and I wanna um, tell you about, like I wanna explain here the main idea and the principles because the, the principles remain the same in all the variations, okay? And as an organization, I think it's very important that from now on we go um, by the same standard. So, as most of you may know, um, like I said, in many cases, the tower is located above the borehole. And the borehole is tens of meters deep under the tower. Okay, so I didn't say, 
but I'm going to go through this presentation by asking you questions, simple questions, and explaining the answers and the logic behind them. Okay? So the bullhole is tens of meters deep under the tower, but still we need accessibility after the construction of the tower, after the construction is built. Um, for example, shock dosing the bullhole, when the, like when the bullhole is under the tower, we still need to shock dose it. So how can we shock dose the, the bullhole after the completion of the construction? Um, so when you enter the pump room, on the right hand side and the close to the door you'll see um the bow hole okay uh it will be protected by a protecting flange okay in the new pump room design we will drill and install a dosing point in the flange and this way we can have access to the bow hole if necessary okay <laughs> sample for shock dosing the bow hole so I'm going, I'm going to explain it in the order of the pump room. So the first thing we have in the pump room is the flange and the shock and the uh, dosing point of the flange. And another thing, wouldn't be much easier when we do maintenance in the pump room that we work in a dry and controlled environment. So how can we do so? We install a bowel valve. So there's a lot of reason that we, wanna, we would want to conduct maintenance inside the pump room. Um, in this case, uh, we want to isolate the pump room and stop the water flow from the bowhole. And we can do so by installing a, a ball valve, a simple valve with a handle. And by turning it, um, we can control the flow from the bowhole uh, to the pump room and work in a sterilized environment. Okay, this is an important one. <laughs> Every day, as you all may know, the pump starts and stops many times a day. Um, and for many reasons, for example, if it's a cloudy day outside and the pump is not getting enough power from the solar panels or the tank is full and the floating switch, which I'll talk about in a few slides, sends a signal to the pump to start working because the tank is full. So um, when this happens, we have um, a lot of water in the pipes that beforehand had a driving force, driving them up to the tower and now when the pump when the pump is has stopped working um they don't have that driving force anymore and the gravity will pull them down pu or push them down more correctly back to the borehole and we don't want all that water from the tank tank and from the pump room and um now going back to the borehole so how can we prevent uh the water flowing back to the borehole We install a non-return valve, okay? A non-return valve, as is more often called an NRV. So an NRV will stop the water from flowing back to the borehole. In a few words, how it works, an NRV is like a gate, okay? That water can only flow in one direction, but cannot, cannot flow back in the other direction, okay? As a simple analogy, it's like a door to your house. If you apply force in entering, your house, the door will open. But no matter how much force you, you apply to the other direction, the door will remain shut. So this is like the logic of the NRV. Okay, so in some sites, we want the ability to monitor the water quality of the borehole, okay? And we can do this by entering a probe. Emily and Gil talked about it uh, yesterday. We can enter a, a probe in the water that will collect data for us and monitor the quality of the water, okay? Um, but as, a, as I said, we're talking about galvanized steel and how can I put a probe in a, in a metal pipe? We might need to think of something in advance. So in the new design, we will install a monitoring point. A monitoring point is like a closed T connector and we can decide if we, want to, if we decide to monitor the water quality, uh, we can open the, the T connector and enter a probe. Okay, There's a, there are various kinds of probes, um, like the ones written here. The most popular are um, for total dissolved solids, TDAs, TDS, um, that um, measure the combined content of inorganic and organic substances in the water. Another popular probe is for pH, for the acidity of the water. 
and the color of the water, the turbidity. And um, so by installing this monitoring point, we have in the future the potential to enter a probe and sense the water quality and, and transmit it back to us to headquarters to see and monitor the water quality of a project if necessary. Like for example, um, Gil and Emily mentioned yesterday that a village might, might be next to agriculture or mining or an industry. And due to seasonality, the water quality might change and we might wanna monitor um, the water quality over time. So this is some reasons why we need a probe. Um, so a monitoring point here will allow us to monitor the raw water from the borehole. Okay, so in water projects in IA, our mission is to give villages clean water. And as written in the manuals, uh, we sample the water a few times in the lifetime of a project. Some samples are done when the project is in process and some are done when the project is complete for, for, uh, for monitoring seasonality, okay? So for example, every project, we, we send the water to the laboratory to an official laboratory to get a state approval if it's fit for human consumption. And when the project is complete, we also want to monitor um, and sample the water because it might change to this due to seasonality like I talked about before. So how can we take a water sample from the borehole water? So we can do it from the pump room, okay? We install a sampling tap. Um, there are a few sampling taps in the pump room and in a project. And the, the sampling tap, taps allow us to easily sample the water from the borehole. And because up until now, the water that has been coming from the borehole is untouched. It's unfiltered and it's, it's, a, it's a good sample of the borehole water and it's an easy way to sample it. Because all you have to do is open the sample tap and uh, sample the water in, in the correct way. So like I said, there's, there's gonna be a few more sam sample taps up, um, along the way. And this is the first one to sample the borehole water. Okay, so um, again, like Emily and Gil showed yesterday, sometimes the water in the borehole isn't, crystal, isn't crystal clear, as you may know. And the mechanical equipment we use inside the pump room is on one hand expensive, but it, it could get clogged and damaged because of the debris that's coming out of the borehole water, okay? So remember that we want these towers to be sustainable as possible and last for years and years to come. So in order to collect the debris and protect our equipment, we install a, a screen filter. It's important that a screen filter uh, would, would uh, optimally be 130 micron mesh screen filter. So on the one hand, it won't, our equipment won't get damaged. On the other hand, this filter will not significantly affect the flow and the pressure in the pump room, okay? Um, by the way, it's very good practice for everyone, especially the engineers that um, enter a pump room to clean um, the filter every time you walk into the pump room. And how can you do this? You can close the ball valve I, I talked about before, okay? And you disconnect the borehole and the flow from the, flow from the borehole to the pump room. And then you can um, flush the water in the, in the pipe into a, a bucket, take out the, the filter over a bucket, clean the filter and, and, and bring it back and screw it back, I mean. Um, it's very good practice and it helps the pump room uh, work and be sustainable. Okay. So it's very important for us to know what the pressure in the pump room is for all kinds of reasons. Like if the pipes are healthy and they have no leaks, and if the pump is working properly or the filter needs to be clean. So how can we measure the pressure in the pump room? We install a pressure gauge. Um, installing a pressure gauge, will let us know what the current pressure in the system is. Um, the pressure gauge is like a, a kind of a clock and its units are usually kilopascal or bar, which are the same. One bar is 100 kilopascal, but you can tell the pressure in the pump room with the pressure gauge. Um, so 
by the way, it's important that the pressure gauge is comes after um, the screen filter because this is one. This is an example of uh, an accessory that can get damaged by the debris from the borehole. So it, it's important that it comes after the screen filter. Um, so another thing I want to talk about: How can we, and more importantly, IA donors? know what uh, the project, how our project is doing, and if it's working properly in the village and getting clean water, okay? We need, we need a way to somehow monitor the volume of the water we're pumping in the village. So to do this, we install a, a flow meter. The flow meter is one of the most important accessories in the pump room and in an IA project. It's connected with a wire to the monitoring box, and it transmit, transmits um, electrical pulses back uh, to the monitoring box, which transmits back to Israel, data of how much water has flown, has, has flowed in a project, okay? And in a couple of words, a flow meter works by having a mechanical wheel and it, it, the wheel spins but with the water that passes through it. And every, let's say a hundred liter, um, it sends a pulse and that's how we know how much uh, water has been flowing in a project, okay? This lets us monitor a few things, like I said, the volume of the water, and help us, it helps us realize um, if there's problems in a village. We look a lot of times at the app and see if a, water, if a village is getting the appropriate amount of, of water, of clean water it should be getting. And most importantly, it can reflect in the inner app to anybody anywhere in the world what's going on in a certain village. Um, so one more thing I wanted to talk about the flow meter. It's very important that the flow meter has at least 10 times its diameter of straight pipe, of length of straight pipe before it, and five times uh, the diameter of straight pipe after it. Okay, so generally uh, we send the flow meters from uh, headquarters and the diameter is over 90% of the time will be um, 3.2 centimeters. So in most cases, we will need 32 centimeters of straight pipe before the flow meter and 16 centimeters at least of straight pipe after um, the flow meter. If this doesn't happen, we might have turbulence in the flow meter, okay? And I told you about the wheel and how it works. If we have turbulence, the readings might be wrong and this can affect our, our monitoring abilities and decision-making for villages. So how can we ensure that we have at least 32 centimeters before and 16 centimeters after? Um, we designed the flow meter to be the first accessory after the bend. So like I said, the dashed line, you, you'll see in a, a top view very soon, but the dashed line is the bend um, going from the right-hand side wall to the wall in front. And if the flow meter is the first accessory on the wall in front, it will have enough space um, of straight line pipe before it and after it. Okay, so in some cases, the water in the village might have um, seasonal microbiological or chemical contaminations, okay? Um, Emily and Gil talked about yesterday. Uh, we, we can know this from the samples we take that I talked about before and sending them to the lab. And, um, and we might need to treat the water um, that the village is getting. So how can we treat the water if it's necessary? We install a water treatment bypass, okay? So like I said, in some cases, we wanna treat the water um, in the pump room, which, the water that the village gets, we wanna treat it from inside the pump room uh, because the pump room is a safe place that we can control. So there are different kinds of contaminations and therefore, there are different kinds of potential solutions for, this con for these contaminations. And we wanted to design a modular solution that can easily connect to all these various kinds of solutions. So that's why we designed the water treatment bypass. The bypass is made of three ball valves that by configuring, configuring them, opening and closing the ball valves, we can change the flow from going straight to the tank or through the bypass and get water treatment if necessary. 
Yes, so let me uh, tell, <clears throat> please go back. Let me just repeat here. Um, in most of the countries, we haven't yet installed water treatment. Uh, we've done it in South Africa. But what we are doing now in all our projects, we are going to prepare inside the pump room the, the necessary uh, pipes in case we will need in the future to install a water treatment. And here we are talking about water treatment when we find in the water coliform, E. coli, meaning a microbiological parameters, things that we can uh, purify. So uh, from now on, in all countries, in all pump room, we're going to ask our contractors to prepare the setup uh, for the future in case we will need to install the water treatment. Thank yeah, you. so thank you, Stephen. So this design that we made is, like I said, modular, and you can add, you can select to add features if you need to. But once we design the same, the same, all, all the pump rooms the same way, we can decide for a few projects to add, let's say, a monitoring point or to add water treatment, and but it's all in the same design. So that's the beauty of this design. Um, and like Sivan said, currently we're piloting our treatment for microbiological contamination in South Africa. And all we do is just connect the bypass and add a dosing system to the bypass. Okay, so now if the water was treated, how can we um, monitor the quality of the treated water if we decide to add water treatment? Um, so after the water treatment, we can add another monitoring point. So we install for the same reasons I mentioned before, we install another monitoring point and another sample tap after the treatment, after the treated water. So we can uh, sample the, the raw water from the borehole from the other uh, sample tap and, mo and monitoring point. And now we can monitor the treated water to see its effectiveness and if it worked. So we install, like I said, a monitoring point and a sample tap after the treatment. So, okay. so far we have two sample taps, one to sample the water from the borehole and one to sample the water after the water treatment. Correct. So we already have two. Correct. And um, okay, so as I mentioned before, once the pump, the, the pump starts and stops many times, and once the pump stops, um, gravity can drive the water down from the tank because the tank is higher than the pump room. So the water from the tank can be, uh, can drive back into the pump room. And this is why, can anybody guess what, what comes next in the pump room accessories? So that we install another non-return valve after the water treatment. So it is, it's important to isolate the pump room from the tank. Um, so like I said, to make sure that the tank, that the water from the tank doesn't flow back into the pump room. And again, for um, maintenance reasons, we might want to isolate the pump room from the tank and the tank from the pump room. So how can we do so? We add, the last thing we add in, in the pump room is a ball valve, okay? A ball valve, a ball valve will be the buffer and I can, if I do maintenance in the pump room, I, I can close the ball valve and I'll have um, a buffer between the tank water um, and the pump room when I do maintenance. So Tal, here again, we have two non-return valves. Correct. One, we are closing it to make sure that the water will not flow back to the borehole. We don't want any water to flow back to the borehole. So that's the non-return valve by the borehole. And then we have installed another one at the end, because here we don't want the water from the tank to flow back to the pump room. So we have two non-return valves. Yes. Correct, Al? Yes, very correct. Thank you, Sivan. Um, I just wanted to, to, for all of you to notice a few notes. Um, all the equipment in the pump room is very heavy, okay? And we have to have support 
Um, so the, the, this equipment can last for years and years to come because you want this, these projects and the pump rooms to be as sustainable as possible. So please insist that when you enter a pump room, there is a support by a steel bar, um, such as a design, okay? And if you see that we need more support, please tell us and please tell the contractor. Um, I think someone mentioned it yesterday, but the, in, in this design, the pump room and the piping in the pump room should be 60 centimeters above ground level. And if for any reason you wanna flush the water from the borehole, we can um, close the first bow valve like I talked about and, um, um, and connect uh, a hose to the cap and flush the water from the borehole by a hose far away from the, from the pump room. So these were a few notes. And um, this is the full design of the pump room. I hope it's much more understandable after I broke it down piece by piece. And just just beautiful, very well done. I think we should also say uh, bravo to Meirav, our graphic designer. Meirav, yes. are you with us? Meirav, say hello to everyone. Of course, I'm with you. Hey, everyone. It's really exciting to be part of it and see everything comes into real thing. <laughs> I Thank hope you. it's really understandable for all of you guys. It's perfect, Thank Mirab. you. Thank you. Excellent job, Mirab. Thank you. And now we'll see it from a, a top view, from a bird view, okay? So it's the same design, but this is how it looks from up top. So you see the bend, and you see the flow meter after the bend. It's the first accessory after the bend. So that's like, that's what I talked about. The, the flow meter will be the first accessory on the front wall. And that will promise us that we have 32 centimeters at least of straight pipe before it and 16 centimeters of straight pipe after it. Okay. Additionally, ideally, uh, because the pipes are on the right hand side in the front, like I said, ideally, in my opinion, the electronic components and the monitoring boxes can be on the left wall as far away as possible from the from the pipes and the water, but um, Ben and May will talk about it soon in their presentation. So this is a photo of a, of a pump room. Uh, it's not just any pump room, it's a new pump room from uh, a few days ago that we were actually all of us supposed to visit in Tanzania. So this is the pump room that, was, that waited for us there. So it's a good looking pump room, but it's not perfect. Um, so the, the ball valves don't have handles, okay? And the design and the, and the piping is from the wall in front and the wall on the left and not on the right and in front, like I mentioned. And the bow hole is coming out from outside, but still um, the pipe is coming from the floor and not the wall. I'll talk about that soon, okay? So this was um, put together before our finalized designs, but so I'll, I'll give in some slack, but I'm telling you from now on, we expect the pump rooms to be perfect because now you have everything you need. You have a design and you'll have a, uh, the manual and it'll be printed for you in the field and for the contractors. And you have a supervision form that we'll talk about soon. And from now on, it should be, in my opinion, like a printing machine. Every pump room should look like the design. Okay, let's talk about a bit about outside the pump room. So in some events, the borehole um, will not be under the pump room. And in this case, we'll build a, a manhole at ground level over the borehole, okay, to protect it. Um, when we do this, if the manhole is big enough, we can choose to put the dosing point uh, cap, first ball valve and non-return valve, um, in the manhole. It gives us maximum uh, control over the bowl hole, um, even though it's outside of the pump room and still locked inside a manhole. Um, here's an example of a manhole outside of the pump room. And, um, and here you see the dosing point cap 
a valve, it should be a ball valve and a non internal valve outside of the pumping. Um, another thing I want to talk about outside the pump room is the lockable cabinet. Okay. So here you can see a lockable, I love this picture of all these people. Here you can see a, a lockable cabinet in the, outside the pump room and in a three meter tower. So why do we need a lockable cabinet? Um, In the lockable cabinet, we have a sample tap, another sample tap. So, and from this sample tap, we can sample the water from the tank. So just a reminder, like Sivan mentioned, we already have two sample taps in the pump room. Um, the first is to sample the water from the borehole. The second is to sample the water um, after the treatment. And this third sampling tap will um, help us realize what the quality of the water is inside the tank. It could be quite different. Like there might be um, some sort of contamination in the tank. And we can only know this by sampling um, the water from the tank. So if we need to sample the water from the tank, we'll have a sampling tap um, in the lockable cabinet. Another thing we'll have, in the, we'll have in the lockable cabinet is a drainage point, okay? So in some cases, if there's contamination, we might need to clean or in any event, may do maintenance in the tank. Um, so in this case, we might need to drain the tank. How can we drain the, the tank? We can connect a hose to the drainage point and drain the, the tank as far away as possible so it won't, uh, to, so it prevent erosion. Erosion is the water taking the soil next to our buildings. And we, we don't want that to happen. So we connect a hose and flush the water as far away as possible um, from, from our buildings. Um, another th important thing to, to notice here is that the, the lockable cabinet is 65 centimeters above ground level. And um, this pipe is with a sample tap and the drainage point is one meter above the above ground level. And, and Tal, just uh, to repeat, this is if we wish to drain the tank. Is that okay. correct? Yes in case we would like to clean the tank or any, any, to do any kind of maintenance and we want to remove the water from the tank, then we're using that drainage point. Yes, Correct. And like I said, with the hose as far away as possible. So every tower we have in a project will have a lockable cabinet because every, every tank needs the ability for us to sample the water from the tank and to drain it if we want to clean it and, um, and do maintenance on it. So the amount of lockable cabins we'll have in a project is as the amount of towers we'll have. Okay, so now I wanna show you the pump room schematics. Um, this is just a schematic of the pump room. It's, it's the same exact design uh, I talked about, but in a non-official engineering format. If, you, if this makes more sense to you, you can print this out in addition to the engineering design and take it with, with you to the field. But I wanted to show you an important difference between a design of a single tower and the design of multiple towers, okay? In the design of a single tower, we'll have a float switch in the tank, okay? A float switch senses when the tank is full. And then if the tank is full, it, it sends a signal to the pump to, to stop working and turn off, okay? So when the tank is full, the pump will stop working. And that's how all projects work with single towers. And this is a schematic of multiple towers. So when there are multiple towers, we don't want to turn the pump off when only one of the tanks is full, right? We don't want the pump to turn off when the 10 meter tank is full and a far away um, tank is not full. And we don't want to add another electrical switch, uh, a floating switch so far away because it's not feasible to run a, a, switch, uh, a cable all the way from the three meter tank to the pump room. So um, in our new design, we came up with the, 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 this solution that when there are multiple towers, we'll have 
um, a float, a mechanical floating valve in the tanks. Okay, a mechanical floating valve um, is mechanical, and it works um, like your toilet works. So when the tank is full, the mechanical floating valve will close the tank, and once it closes the tank, the pump will continue to pump straight to the other tanks. And once all the tanks are full and they all have mechanical float valves, then the pump will still continue to pump, but now the water has no place to go. So when the water has no place to go, the pressure in the pipes will start building up and building up. And this is why we put inside the pump room a pressure switch. A pressure switch can sense the pressure inside the pump, inside the pipes. And once it hits a threshold and the, and the pressure builds up too much, that will send a signal to the pump to, to shut off. Meaning only when all the tanks are full, the pump will shut off, okay? So uh, I hope this is clear. It might be a, a bit confusing, but for a single tap, we will use a floating switch, a switch that turns off the pump when the, tank, when the one tank is full. And for, and for multiple towers, we'll use a mechanical floating valve for every tank and a pressure switch. Um, again, when there are multiple towers, we don't want the water um, from the other towers to flow back into the pump room or into the 10 meter tank, because remember the additional towers will be higher than um, the, the main tower, the 10 meter tower. So we will install another, an additional non-return valve, additional NRV inside on, on the pipe that is heading to the, to the additional towers. Um, but I just wanna bring up a uh, an, uh, something that Sivan said yesterday. We will from now on try to avoid as much as possible multiple tower projects, okay? But this is in case we have multiple towers in a project. Um, another thing I'll need to add when we have multiple towers is an additional ball valve. So this ball valve will also be a buffer between the other uh, tanks we have and the pump room. So if I wanna isolate the pump room, I need to close um, all the ball valves inside the pump room that are heading to the tanks, to all tanks. Okay, so here you can see the full design um, from above and, and you can get a full picture, okay? Um, this is next to the bill of materials. So in the bill of materials, you, you'll see all the accessories, all the piping, all the quantities, diameters, length, and their description, okay? The IDs in the bill of materials match the, the numbers on the, on the design. And I hope it looks kind of scary but I hope that now after going uh, piece by piece on the, on the, of the design, it's much more understandable. And I urge you again to print this and take it with you to the field and the schematic too, if it feels more comfortable. Um, just a second, wait, just want to say one more thing. Um, this bill of quantities is part of the new BOQ. Okay, so, so you'll have all these accessories and all these, this piping in the new BOQ. So now that you have um, the bill of materials, the design and the contractor, and everybody knows the design and how it's supposed to look like, you should start and you have all the accessories with you, um, bought in advance by the BOQ. We should start seeing the same, like I said, the same pump room everywhere we go. Um, just one small thing before I finish. Um, every tank has three pipes connected to it. The inlet tank, uh, the inlet pipe, um, the outlet pipe, and the overflow pipe. Um, so the inlet pipe is the water from the bowl hole through the pump room going in the tank. The outlet pipe is the water from the tank going to the taps. And the overflow pipe is for uh, air to enter and uh, exit the tank, and additionally, if the uh, floating switch or floating valve don't work, then you will see uh, water from the tank 
because of the pressure in the uh, building up, you will see water from the tank um, ex uh, exiting the tank through the overflow uh, pipe. So that will uh, that will uh, give you a sign that something is wrong if water is uh, is being released from the tank. So you can see here that it is important that the inlet and outlet pipes are 90 degrees one to the one to another, and the outlet pipe and the overflow pipe are also 90 degrees one to another. Here we can see it in the project. So the inlet is from here, the outlet is 90 degrees from it, and the overflow pipe and the vent pipe is also 90 degrees from the outlet pipe. And that's it. Thank you very much. Amazing, Tal. Tal. We have so many questions. I think um, <laughs> you've reached the, <laughs> the maximum amount of questions possible oh, um, out of presentation <laughs> so far. So how much time do we have? About 15 minutes, Ivan? Oh, certainly. Atal, please stop sharing your screen. And okay. also, we also have Yaakov Orenstein with us, and we have Yaron, and we have Shai, and we have Mori. So we have so many water engineers with us that uh, all of them, with the help of Tal, can answer your questions. So please don't be shy. Send your questions now. Okay. Um, I also know that Shai was doing an amazing job trying to answer along the way, but I'm going to kind of start from the top um, and work our way through. And um, Shai, forgive me if you've already answered. Um, okay. So there's a question from the Tanzania team. Um, sorry, from the from Rogers from the Uganda team. Can we replace the plastic mechanical filters with brass strainers slash brass filters? Cleaning the plastic filters by the communities is a little challenging and they end up breaking. So it is possible. Uh, Shai, do you want to answer? Um, it, yeah, is, Yaakov, it is possible, but it should have the specifications it. of, like I said, exactly. 130 micron mesh screen filter. Okay? That's what's important of the screen filter to protect our equipment. Yeah. And what I answered in the chat before is we should uh, start reviewing which kind of filters we are um, actually installing. So I would like to have the specifications of those filters you are going to install and then can review like the range that we have and decide which are better. And it's very good that you're coming forward with this kind of uh, feedback so we know. Yeah, As along the same lines, um, Dale mentioned that uh, he said, I think cleaning the mechanical filters should be included among the trainings to the pump attendants of every project, which, which is definitely important. And I know there's another question about how often these filters should be cleaned. So if you have anything to say there. So I agree. I think it should be part of the operator training. So every pump room has an operator and he should know how to clean the filter because it is important. How often to clean a filter it depends on the water quality and the water from the borehole, but it's good practice that almost every time an operator goes inside the pump room, or let's say every week, to, make, to, to manually clean the filter. Okay, fantastic. Also, another thing Dio uh, has mentioned about the filters here that you can easily tell when they are uh, when there's debris inside because you can hear the sound of the water trying to force itself through the filter. So you can take note of that and tell the your manics that they can actually tell just by the sound. Good job, Dio. 20 points. <laughs> um, okay, so Irabalane asked, are we allowed to start installing digital flow meters we received from Israel? I think this is actually a question for Meir. Uh, is he with us? Yes. Wonderful. Yes, yes, please start installing them for sure. We're trying to get shipments out so that you have actually a, a water meter even before the, the construction is completed. So you can do it at the end of the, the construction. Obviously, that's ideal. And if you do have water meters there with you from Israel, we can install them uh, in the construction process. 
Mayor, are we going to start sending meters separately from monitoring units as well? Yes, um, that is the, the plan. Uh, according to the, situ the current situation is that we have uh, three types of meters in, in our projects in Africa. We have the, the plastic black one, Arad, the black plastic one. We have the, the ultrasonic Arad, the blue one. And we have brass metal of Arad that we send really in the past and we are going to send them again this year. Also, we have in, in uh, South Africa local uh, brass metal meters, but that's, that is only in uh, South Africa. Uh, this year, I'm planning to send uh, a lot of meters as soon as, uh, as I can. Probably in February, I will send each country about 50 or 60 water meters. Um, okay, uh, another question from the Zambia team. Is it easy to know if any single component or accessory in the pump room is not working? Or is it common for any of the components to stop? How would we know? Essentially, I think it's a question of maintenance of the accessories. Uh, yeah, it is a question of maintenance. As we just discussed before about the filter, you can actually hear the sound of the wiring through there, but it really depends on what is the type of problem that you are detecting yeah. in the pump room. Is the water not flowing through the flow meter? Is the flow meter stopped? Uh, does the pressure in the pressure gauge shows a pressure that is below what you would expect? There are many different problems that can occur, um, and we should detect like the problems for each individual case. Actually, the pressure gauge is a good indicator for if we have any problem in the pump room, because if the pressure is is rising above what we expect, then there is probably one of the valves is partially open or partially closed. Uh, or maybe one of the fittings is, is closed. So if, if we see a pressure above what we expect, then it might indicate of a problem in the pump room. But usually the, the, these fittings are, are, are reliable and there shouldn't be any problem. Um, of course, you should notice that some of the valves should be normally open and some of the valves should be normally closed and make sure that they are completely open or completely closed. That's, uh, that's for you guys to, to check. Maybe this is a question kind of silly from a non-engineer, but is there any way to connect kind of an alert system from the pressure gauge the same way that we do with the water flow meter? So for instance, if that we can see from, you know, from not a, a field visit, if the pressure gauge is, is, is too high, it's an excellent question, and uh, I think we can think about uh, this type of solution. I've already talked to Mary about it to monitor the pressure of, of, of the water coming out of the tank, but we can also monitor online the pressure uh, of the water coming into the tank. So if we see that there is a rise in the pressure that we do not expect, then it can indicate a problem. So it's a good question and a good idea. Um... Pascal asked, and a few people were asking if we could go over the diameter design of the around the water meter. Pascal asked, please, the flow meter with a diameter of 32 millimeters does not influence the does it not influence the water transit flow rate? Um, the 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 water meters that we are using are. Uh, uh, more than fit to, to measure in, in high accuracy uh, the, the common flow that the boreholes pump. So it, actually the maximum flow rate that they can measure in uh, high accuracy, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's 12 cubic meters per hour. So it's, it's more than sufficient for most of our projects. So there's no problem about it as long as, as, we, as we install the the water meter as shown in the in the drawing that we have a straight uh, pipe of th 32 centimeters before and six at least 16 centimeters after so this way we keep that the flow is laminar and uh, that the water is metering uh, with the uh, high accuracy i would just to add that the water meters are uh, billing certified meaning that we use them in israel in america in europe to to bill people to charge people so it's it's extremely accurate as yaron said as long as we are in the in the range the suitable range 
Um, another question uh, from Boniface. He said, yesterday a question was asked if it's okay to shock dose the borehole with the pump already installed. The answer was that you need to remove the pump because you don't want to leave high a concentration of chlorine in, uh, around the pump. Um, so he said, then why do we need a dosing point when the pump has to be removed before dosing? Kindly clarify as this contradicts the response that was given yesterday. Can I come on this or Tal, would you like to answer? Go for it, Emily. Okay, so two things I wanted to add from um, Tal's presentation. The first was that um, he said that a lot of the boreholes are underneath the towers, and that had been um, the procedure when we started the year off. We said that it would just make it more um, uh, simple and straightforward, but we've actually found that um, in some of the boreholes, we had to go back and do maintenance, and it was very difficult to do maintenance with the borehole inside the tower. So it can be outside of the tower, and if it needs to be inside the tower, to protect from theft, then that's one of the reasons, but otherwise it's easier to do maintenance when the borehole is outside of the tower. Um, when it comes to the, the shock dosing, sometimes we won't be able to take out the whole pump. And so, like I said before, it's not great for the pump. The pump can um, withstand that sort of chlorine. It's more ideal if you can take out the pump, but if not, it will withstand that, uh, that shock dosing. It's not a matter of shock dosing it every day that can cause some sort of, um, uh, corrosion, but that shock dosing point can also be used for monitoring in the future. So I think that's also another important thing. We can use that shock dosing point to put in a diver if we want to measure what the water level is or a water level meter or other probes that can measure the salinity, anything like that. It's just a great access point for us to do uh, monitoring on that borehole. So it's not the end of the world. You shouldn't shock dose every day. That would be the, the quick answer. Yes, and, and once again, we're only going to shock those the borehole after the completion of a project, just if <clears throat> after going and doing water quality controls and we are seeing that the water is not good for human consumption, then we will then go and do a, a, the shock dosing of the borehole. So it's not something that we're going to be doing often, uh, at least I hope so. So as Emily said, it's okay if we have to do it and use that dosing point uh, for the shock dosing. And it can be inside of the pump room or outside of the pump room. Yeah, Yaron, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. One, one more emphasis. This dosing point uh, also should be sealed with the bushing and the cap because we want to isolate the ball from the environment. So in the picture that we saw before, the, the, it was open, but it should be sealed with the cap. Okay, to continue with more questions. Have a few more minutes. Yes, please, please. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, Andy Fili from South Africa asks, can we please have the pressure gauge before the water leaves the pump room to the tank, meaning a second pressure gauge that will enable us to see the final pressure leaving the pump room? You can install a pressure gauge uh, when you wish. I'm sorry, there's another call being here, so I hope you can hear me. But you can install a second pressure gauge where the uh, monitoring is set at the end of the line where the monitoring probe should be entered. You can also install the pressure shy, gauge sorry, there. Shy, you... shy, we cannot hear you well. Somebody else is speaking? Sorry. Is somebody else speaking next to you? What Shai is trying to say that you can install the pressure gauge at the uh, last monitoring point in the pump room. So, and actually in the fila in South Africa, because it's UPVC, um, you can actually just, add, it's quite easy to add a pressure gauge around the UPVC pipe and see the pressure. Um, and you don't have to install it everywhere. You can actually test it by seeing how much pressure drops in the pump room. If you have a pressure gauge in the beginning of the pump room and you see the pressure at the end of the pump room, you can see what the drop is in the pump room if you need to. So you can actually um, go with the pressure gauge with you if you need to check the pressure in the pump room. Yeah, it can be connected uh, temporarily to the sampling tap. So if you want to see the local head losses in the pump room, you can connect it to the sampling tap, which is located uh, downstream from the uh, water treatment area. Um, okay. 
Another question um, from Yazenga. Um, he asked if we should use a flap or a spring type for the NRVs. Can you repeat? I didn't fully understand the question. Yazenga asked for the NRVs, should we use a flat or spring type? Um, I think we should see the specifications for both and we'll decide, uh, we will give an answer for that later. Okay. If we don't um, have already a specification for the NOVs. Okay, um, Hagar asked, where do we place the lockable cabinet when we only have a 10 meter tower in a project? I'm sorry, can you repeat? I didn't hear the question. Hagar asked, where do we place the lockable cabinet when we only have a 10 meter project, 10 meter tower in a project? So it's uh, on the pump boom wall on the outside end. So coming down, um, you'll have an outlet pipe coming down from the tank of the 10 meter. And you have a lockable cabinet um, on the left side of the door or on the left hand um, uh, wall on the outside of the pump room. Okay. Um, for the projects with low yield, can we install two control valves for water management purposes by the community? I'm, I'm not sure I understood the, the question. Maybe the person who wrote it can, can explain okay. it. Hello, Barani. Thank you so much, Thank you. Oh, Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I just wanted to check in terms of uh, the control well. Rebelani, maybe you can retype it. Sorry about because... that again. I just oh. wanted to check in terms of the, uh, the verbs which controls um, water going to the tabs. Uh, mostly on the design, we have one control valve which uh, controls 10 tabs. But we have projects with low yield uh, that in, in most of the times the community will struggle if they don't have water management. So is it possible to have to, to divide the Tabs into two, and then we have two valves uh, controlling five five of the tabs. Thank you. Okay, now I understand. So you want to ration the water supply. You want to, for some hours, you want to close the valve and, and supply the water to one part of the village, and in the other hours, you want to close the valve and open the other valve to supply for the other part of the village. So this is, a, uh, of course, it is doable and uh, based on your experience and, uh, and, and knowledge of, of, the, of the local situation, you can, of course, uh, do it. And, but it has to be handled manually by someone in the village that he is in charge of the rationing. So not anybody will have an access to these valves and just uh, decide by, on his own mind what the, when to wash in the water. So uh, it has to be managed, but of course it's doable. Okay, another question. Um, we had a, a question from Menzi, um, who says he thinks it's a good idea to have a drain outlet at the three meter to clean the float, float valve and tanks for maintenance. What are the thoughts here? Yes, yeah, oh, yeah. sure. Any question? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And any elevated the water tank should have this uh, option for drainage and cleaning. So otherwise, we won't have it. If we don't have it, then we won't be able to clean it or maintain it when necessary. So this lockable cabinet is also valid for seven meter and three meter towers. Okay. 
Um, Bidine Cameroon asked, mm -hmm. uh, may I suggest that the overflow pipe be designed to be along the structure so that on a windy day, the water doesn't mess up the structure and create water marks? I can answer that. Uh, we designed the overflow to be uh, sticking out so the community can see the overflow of the water when it occurs and then they can understand there's a problem and go and close the valve so the pump will not continue to pump water to the tank. If we have it alongside the, the water tower, then they won't be able to detect when there's a problem and then they will uh, all this water will get wasted. So in that case, maybe we should decide what is the recommended length of the overflow pipe, because sometimes it's too short and then all the water, we are seeing them like actually on the tower. So in the design, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a one meter pipe. Uh, it's all in the specifications. It's all in the drawings. I've also sent you a link for the drive so you can see it. Uh, it should be specified here. Yeah, it is not to do in the bill of materials in uh, the drawings. You can see exactly what is the length. I can tell you right now it is. Oh, I can't see it right now, but you can all go and look for it. Maybe let's make it a, a quiz. What is the length of the overflow pipe? Although it's go not just the length the that's important, right? It's also the angle of the spout so that it's angled away from the tower. As a matter of it fact, Ombre, the pipe should be 30 centimeters out of the tower. So in that case, because of the uh, falling of the water, it will be far away from the tower, maybe two or three meters, but people will hear the noise and will see the flow of the water. That's why, and the tower will be protected because if you get 30 centimeters outside the tower, nothing will happen. It should be like 60 centimeters overall, but it depends. And the, 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 the rule is 30 centimeters out from the tower. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I usually the have... overflow, usually the overflow should not uh, be uh, uh, operating. So if there is an overflow, then it's an indication for for some type of problem in the float switch or, or other problems. So that's why it should be it should be seen and and, and visual. Tara, any more questions? Um, um, if... Actually, yes, there's a lot more questions, but I think we've wrapped up our time on this session. So I know that Shai's already tried to go through and answer some of them. I would recommend that um, uh, you guys continue these conversations in the water engineering trainings. And, and also, as I mentioned yesterday on day four, and day five, we're going to be spending a lot of time together, all the engineers together, answering all kinds of questions, reviewing in more depth uh, the pump room and all the accessories. So here, what we try to give you this morning is just an overview about what we have in a pump room for all of you to understand the basics. But of course, we're going to go over it once again in more depth uh, in the next few days. So. Uh, let's move on to the next session. Are you ready for that? And then we're going to take a break in one hour. So, Tal, once again, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, thank excellent you. PowerPoint. Everyone, please applaud. Tal. Well, come on. His first I presentation. Way to go. I just want to say to all the engineers, as a non-engineer, all of your presentations were so clear, so simple. I think you did a great job of presenting the basics to all of the non-engineers among us. So really thank you very much for wonderful presentations. Thank you, Agar. Many of them hated me for many weeks. Uh, they had to come, rehearse, change, redo, redesign. Um, and I think he, I, I agree with you that uh, I think he paid off. Uh, they are doing so well and it's very clear. I'm very proud of, of, of all of them. Um, okay. 
a very exciting session right now and actually very important because oftentimes when we deal with water projects, we're only talking about the civil engineering, the water engineering, but what about the electricity? All the electricity, everything that has to do with um, the lighting inside the pump room, outside the pump room, the monitoring system, we need to spend some time understanding what the electrical engineer does. What does he do when he comes to a water project? And you're gonna see that actually the electrical engineer does quite a lot in order to make sure that everything is operating. And this is what now Ben is going to uh, present to us. Ben, are you ready? 